Thank you all for inviting us here today. Um, I'm Katie Panarella. I'm the Director of Nutrition, Family, and Consumer Sciences Program and Policy. Um, in that capacity, I'm the FNAP Director as well as the, Master, the Director of the Master Food Preserver Program. Um, I'm here with my colleagues, Missy Gable, the Director of the uh, UC Master Gardener Program, and Shannon Harillo, um, the Director of the Statewide 4-H Program. So we're here today to share with you all a little bit about our programs um, and then specifically highlight some of the integrative efforts that we've been doing across the state, across uh, the five statewide programs that we all oversee. And um, our responsibilities include uh, leadership and vision for all, I'm not gonna keep listing the programs, we'll talk about them all today, um, establishing program priorities, program guidance, um, ensuring consistency across programs and really making sure that our programs are staying up to date with the latest research um, that um, our advisors and specialists are conducting. So good. So with that, we'll get started. We have a lot of ground to cover. So um, yeah, so we'll start out with nutrition, family, and consumer sciences. Um, uh, NSCS is what is the acronym we use. I'll try not to use too many acronyms. I'll try to spell most of them out. Is embedded with uh, 4-H under what we call youth families and communities. Um, we've experienced a little bit of a reorganization, but um, it is considered sort of an administrative unit that holds both NFCS, which in, NFCS includes uh, FNAP, which is our Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program, UC Master Food Preserver, and our sister nutrition education program, which I won't go into too much detail about because I know you all are very familiar with SNAP-Ed, which is UC Calfresh, one of the state implementing agencies that we have a contract with UC Davis. So we received the pass-through funding from UC Davis to UC a r for that, uh, about $9 million. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we have 4-H, who also has project learning um, that is part of um, their program. So the NFCS programs through the advisors and specialists at the local level are performing uh, applied research and research-based extension and education, partnering with community-based organizations, agencies, um, coalitions, policy councils um, to promote the area, the discipline of NFCS, um, specifically with an emphasis on the strategies of food literacy, food security, food resource management. Um, this is why I went first. <laughs> uh, food safety, and then the NSDS component is that financial literacy component and consumer education, which um, historically we had more of an emphasis on. A lot of those folks have retired, the, the real true home eckers, um, but, we, but um, some of that work still continues today. Um, our footprint right now are, uh, covers about 35 counties. Um, we have uh, 12 NSCS advisors, and then we have a YFC advisor, that Youth Families and Communities Advisor, whose emphasis is typically to integrate both the 4-H and then maybe an NSCS program. So it could be UC CalFresh or it could be FNEP. Um, and then we, the nutrition education programs, FNEP and UC CalFresh, are in a total of 40 counties. So we have a couple out there that don't have coverage. Um, and then UC Calfresh is in 32, FNF's in 24. Um, we have both programs in 16 and a Master Food Preserver in 17. So I will share all of this if you're interested. Um, so some of the great projects in action across the state that our advisors are leading. This is a CEFA specialty crop grant uh, received in Central Sierra. They have a very strong, with Katie Johnson, uh, I don't know if this has a pointer, I'm probably going to break it if I try, Katie Johnson's so right there. Oh, it's Candace doesn't work on the screen. Um, Katie Johnson is a new uh, NFCS advisor. She was a UC Berkeley public health nutrition student. Yes, yeah. oh good, yeah, she's fantastic. And this is um, a specialty crop uh, grant. She's the, uh, yeah, second from the right there. And this is a collaborative project with Master Gardener, UC CalFresh, like I said, they have a strong relationship with Food Corps there, um, using and utilizing um, high school extenders to promote physical activity and the consumption of specialty crops um, and healthier eating um, with their um, with the youth. So this was a great uh, this is a great model of that collaboration. Another great example of some collaborative work. Um, um, with, with NFCS is down in Riverside, San Bernardino area, led by Shatima Gandaforn, um, our NFCS advisor based out of Riverside. 
And as you can see, this is a very large collaborative project with almost nine entities. Um, this was the Kaiser Permanente Heal Zone grant. It was a small grant, but integrated, um, they created 18 community plots, uh, garden plots. Uh, they had monthly garden club with master gardeners, uh, the garden mural, as well as uh, the 4-H uh, youth garden activities too. So just a really great way to fully do some wraparound integrated programming. So next, I'm going to just talk a little bit about FNAP. I, I wasn't sure what your familiarity was. I just thought that I would spend a little bit of time on it. Um, I don't often compare these FNAP with UC Cal Fresh, but I think it's helpful to highlight how they are both distinct and unique because we have both of that, both programs. Um, FNAP's been around for a long time. It's been it's, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. We're excited about that. Um, we received the second largest allocation in the country. It's a land grant specific nutrition education program. So it's in 76 states and territories, which is pretty cool. Um, and it's funded through NIFA. So um, we received that funding directly to the land grants. We have about 54 um, staff and about uh, oh, 64 staff across 54 FTE. And what's, I think, unique to cooperative extension to highlight about FNAP is that it was designed specifically because they felt cooperative extension wasn't reaching a specific segment of low income po low income populations with their programming. And so FNAP was designed and originally people were going into their homes. So really that really one on one um, um, delivery mode um, and uh, and it's evolved through the years to um, also main, continue the series-based nutrition education, um, which is its primary focus and delivery mode. Um, and it's a peer education, peer educator model. So we hire from within the communities that we serve. Direct nutrition education. The expectation is 10 to 12 hours in our adult program. You can imagine it's pretty tough to get people to come back for nine or 10 classes, but we we managed to do it and six classes uh, to graduate for our youth program, which is in schools that are typically serving low income, 50% um, uh, or more free and reduced lunch. Um, the target audience is different than UC Cal Fresh. It's only families with children living in the home and then our youth program in the um, um, free and reduced lunch schools. So a little bit more limited than a SNAP-Ed eligible population. Um, and then we have a mandatory evaluation component. So we have a lot of great data. Um, and then we also have a mandatory 24-hour food recall mm -hmm. component, which is no joke. So um, that, those efforts have been designed and led by um, the Townsend Lab, Maryland Townsend, our uh, now emeritus um, FNAP specialist. Katie, would it slow you down too much to say a little bit about the evaluation? Does yeah, I talk a little bit about that in my next slide, but I'll, I'll show you. Yeah, no, that's okay. Can I also interrupt you? Because um, I, I don't know where, where does the nutrition education usually happen for FNF now? It's, it's no longer home-based, is it? Yes, is it's it through education model and community based yeah, through our partnership with community-based organizations and agencies, ESL class, technical schools um, for the adults. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the youth program and after school programs and other models. Yeah, summer lunch that I do. Yeah, and it's sometimes very, fan it can be family based. So if there's something where families are attending together, we'll try to both, we'll sort of try to saturate serving both youth and adult classes. And then with UC CalFresh, I don't know how some, you guys are probably pretty familiar with UC CalFresh. Um, established in 1988, we had about uh, almost 14 million um, that was that they received um, through CDSS, um, it's an F and S program. About 120 staff across the state. They are A and R employees funded through this grant. So I'm sort of responsible for that contract, making sure they feel like they have a home with us. And um, they're in 32 counties. And again, the emphasis on direct nutrition education, but comprehensive programming with the policy systems and environmental. <laughs> um, and just you all are probably very familiar with the social ecological model and here you can see I can't use my pointer but you know FNAP has traditionally focused within sort of the inner circles of really impacting individual behavior change um, they are now developing more trying to work more in environmental settings and sectors of influence um, um, but and snap -Ed is working across all core um, sectors and, and variable um, ways. So the mission is to assist uh, low-income youth and families to acquire knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behavior necessary 
to choose nutritionally sound diets, contribute to their personal development, and improve the family diet and nutritional welfare. And I think what makes SNF also unique is you really see the quality of life piece where, you, where people feel very empowered to um, care for their families and, and that they can do it and they have the skills to do it. Um, we were required to use research ba uh, evidence based curricula for all of our programs. I put research here because some of them were not all evidence based, but we created, we have de designed a lot of the curricula that we use. So um, um, that's wonderful. And our adult evaluation component so we have the food behavior, uh, food and physical activity questionnaire is brand new. It's the FPAC, that is a, a national uh, evaluation. A uh, very long tool that we are mandated to use, and then the food tracker is the 24-hour food recall, and then the enrollment form um, was also designed by the Townsend Lab, as well as the food tracker um, um, uh, materials and uh, process and protocol. Um, our youth evaluation, Eat Well and Move, is the K-2 evaluation tool. Um, that was designed by the Townsend Lab and then the thing about my class one. And then we have um, evaluation tools for six through eight and uh, three through fifth, six through eight, and nine through twelve, all um, um, through the, the national office, the national assessment office. Um, we have a, a database that we're, we use, um, so we have, which is now becoming, um, we are actually have quite a bit of data so we can start doing some longitudinal studies to really look at sustained behavior change. Okay, okay I'm wondering what kind of dynamic <coughs> is your program in terms of the evaluation? How often do you use the evaluation modification? We have to use it every time. So there's no modification allowed for the evaluation tool. No, I mean oh. for the program, like if the evaluation results don't come back, if they're not as strong. Yeah, as so can then you modify hmm. your programming based on that? <coughs> Um, no, they wouldn't be considered graduates then, so uh, not too much. We have some makeup lessons. I guess that's which, yes, yeah, so they can do makeup lessons as well in order to graduate the class. Yeah. Okay. Great. Some of our impacts from last year. I haven't quite updated them this year. We just had our database reopened. Um, we're serving about 6,000 families, which is, you know, a small number, but we are, you know, impacting full families. Um, and about 51,000 in 24 counties, <clears throat> 23,000 youth, uh, both using direct and we do train teachers, and we got approval to do that um, as extenders of uh, FNEP. We're serving about, you know, three about three quarters of the families we serve are, are Latino, um, and uh, we have about 85% of our adults showing improved food resource management, and then also. Um, 75% um, are showing improved food safety practices, and almost all of the adults are showing positive change in um, food choices, including more fruit, vegetables, including whole grains, um, and lean protein in their diet. So um, that 24-hour recall shares a lot of information. And then you see the cost savings, which can really add up for these 6,000 families every year. And we offer, um, FNIP in six languages as well, Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Hmong, Russian. Um, again, really hiring from the community that we're serving. Uh, some new models for success. We're ending the second round of the MAFRI project uh, with uh, testing the feasibility of FNEP in medical settings. So we've been working very closely with UC Davis Medical Center and WellFaith um, um, in some of these clinics um, to test some obesity, parenting, and diet quality assessment tools, primarily with Spanish-speaking families, working with Head Starts as well to, to, to validate these tools. Um, and that's ending, and we'll then be trying to scale this up across the state um, with some guidance. Okay, real quick on the Master Gardener program, so I can turn it over to my colleagues. Um, our mission with, Ma I'm sorry, Master Food Preserver. <laughs> you can do this. Um, yeah, no, I'm not saying this. This is good. Um, our mission is to teach research-based practices of safe home food preservation to the residents of California. Um, our impact for, uh, today um, in, for fiscal year 18, uh, we have about 440 volunteers across the state um, donating 21,000 hours in volunteer time, 12 programs in 17 counties, as I mentioned, resulting in about 14,000 contacts. Um, our intended outcomes are primarily, this is a food safety program, really to instruct on safe food handling, 
um, our academic advisors provide, our NFCS advisors are often providing that academic oversight to the program to uh, teach food preservation techniques, to encourage home food preservation as a means of increasing nutrition and decreasing food costs with that reorganization that's, I think, going to get um, augmented with the National Food Preserver Program. Here's some great collaborative work that we've done. This is in San Joaquin County um, and their beautiful LEED certified emergency. That's the place to be in an emergency <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, and uh, with their open garden day. And so there's some it's a great collaboration and great opportunity for the master food preservers demonstration uh, working alongside the master gardeners and the junior master food preserver program here with some 4-H youth uh, that recently uh, got released, yeah, and uh, it's a fantastic way, and the uh, Junior Master Food Preserver Program is a project for the 4-H youth, so they work alongside a 4-H volunteer as well as a um, Master Food Preserver volunteer. We've been tapped to do strategic planning, that's been my focus, that will be my focus next week too, um, and so we're really looking to, um, you know, elevate as we go through the strategic planning process to the uh, how the master food preserver can decrease food costs, increase food security, increase food choices, decrease food waste, you know, really using abundant produce. And the program's really already doing that, but how can we really have, make that more visible? And then we've, we've added um, this, is there a way that we can increase the economic development through support of small food entrepreneurs? So looking at food entrepreneurship and seeing if there's a way it can fit in with master food preserver, whether it's training, um, um, well, I don't know. lots of growth opportunities here. My background's in food banks, San Francisco Food Bank. Um, partnership potential, farmers markets, all the great folks that you're working with, to cottage foods, work groups, food co-ops, and then of course looking at what our possible funding potential could be. And with that, I will turn it over. We, I guess we're waiting till the end to do questions, or um, if anyone has yeah. questions now, I can yield them. Yeah, go ahead. For the adult classes for ESNAP, yes. you said that it's hard to get adults to come back for all the classes. Yes. Do you have any like idea of what is your retention rate of participants yeah. starting and then not and finishing the program sure. compared to those that drop out? Yeah, yeah. Um, as you can imagine, the political climate has impacted our clientele significantly. And so that can really change whether or not a class is going to continue. Our, we've seen our class sizes probably decrease to about a third to a quarter of what they used to be. Um, and we're trying to come up with some new models for people to um, do the classes back at home or online or uh, sort of new ways of delivery because people are feeling really, um, I'd have to get that number for yeah. you, but they're feeling very um, concerned about leaving their homes right now. And so, you know, we may be working with an ESL class and mm -hmm. people may not feel comfortable coming mm -hmm. based on what's happening. So it's, it's really changed, so we have to be mindful of that. And we're just, we're trying to be innovative mm -hmm. and creative with that. Mm -hmm. What is the demographic for people participating in the Master Food Preserver Workshop? Yeah, I I don't have that information with me, but um, um, we are looking, one of our uh, goals is to, you know, with the reorganization to put uh, Master Food Preserver under NFCS is, I think, a huge opportunity for us to really be focusing on increasing the diversity of the program, creating access for diverse audiences, and not only through diverse, that are diverse, but also socioeconomically, across socioeconomic classes. So we're really, we're trying, we're moving in that direction. Yeah, Wendy. You, you didn't mention the evaluation of the Master Food Preserver Program. Do you have an embedded evaluation? No, yeah. not just yet. So that I'm hoping that will come out of the strategic planning process, mm -hmm. um, but no, they haven't a formal evaluation of it. Yeah. Great. Good. Okay. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll touch on the 4-H evaluation because I didn't do our statewide evaluation, but I did do a project. But okay. Um, so a little bit about 4-H. Feel free to ask questions throughout, of course. Um, so our mission is to engage youth in reaching their full potential through providing high-quality evidence-based programs. But also, we work to advance the field of youth development, and so we have this dual mission of both delivering programming and conducting and um, disseminating research. So we do have an advisor footprint, just like all the other statewide programs, um, specialists as well. 
and uh, the state office also helps coordinate and do research within the program. And some of you are involved in some of those research projects, I heard. Some of the core elements of our program is we are delivered in every, cal in every uh, county in California that's serviced by cooperative extension. We actually do Alpine use as well, even though we don't have a cooperative extension office, so we are in every county. 4-H reaches 142,000 youth annually. Our, we service young people and engage young people ages 5 to 19 in our program for high school years. We focus on both educational content in, in our program, but also the context. The context is where 4-H really distinguishes itself from other youth serving programs, is that it's delivered in a positive youth development environment. And I'll talk more about what that looks like. And then in 4-H, learning occurs through hands-on project-based work. We use an approach called inquiry-based learning. Also, it's framed with an experiential learning model. So that is what we call our pedagogy or teaching practices, are those two pieces of the pie. And that is part of the value of our educational programming is that we do use that approach to the delivery of programming. And there's a whole research base behind both those concepts. Everybody familiar with, anyone familiar with those? Yeah, okay. Um, and we also have over 14,000 trained volunteers, both youth and adults, that disseminate uh, research-based information into the community and also lead programming. And 4-H was established 100 years ago, so at the turn of the 20th century. We are the oldest program, I'm sure, in uh, Cooperative Extension. And we were established initially to really integrate new, new agricultural technology into communities through youth. So the whole impetus of 4-H has always been, how do we get communities, parents, others to adopt practices? And by educating our young people is the mechanism that 4-H originally evolved in. But as you know, the, the world has changed a lot in 100 years, and so 4-H has as well. And so you might associate 4-H with agriculture, and that is definitely true. But our program is so much more because we've evolved to meet the current community, state, and national needs. So our current focus areas are really around improving scientific literacy. I would say this is our strength. If I had to pick, um, well, it's our strength over healthy living. <laughs> so it's our, <laughs> that's our strength. Um, and that's why we partner so brilliantly with our other statewide programs and others like NPIs because we do bring that youth engagement focus, but we really have ramped up our STEM efforts over I would say the last 15 years. So this has been where we're hiring our academics. This has been where we're developing content and curriculum. So we really have increased that. As you know, California ranks real, relatively low among the top two states um, in the US in scientific literacy. So that's where we're spending a lot of our time. We also do work um, in healthy living to improve healthy living. We really focus on a well-rounded healthy living approach, really focusing on socio-emotional health, as well as nutrition education and physical activity. Uh, mindfulness is one of our most populated, uh, popular programmatic areas currently, and then yoga as well. Here is a program where it was an integration with um, UC CalFresh in a SciFAR grant, so that's the middle picture. And then obviously, um, part of our bread and butter has always been to engage young people as citizens in their community and make sure that they're well informed and capable of making really good decisions uh, moving forward and using scientific information um, to make those decisions. So um, a core of what we do is engagement and leadership. As I mentioned, content and context are really important to the program. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the delivery of our program and then our PYD approach. So we deliver our programs through a variety of different ways. We have organized clubs, which are in communities, in school settings, after school settings, and we're on every military installation throughout the state of California, with the exception of the Marines. We don't have an MOU with them. We have over 800 clubs and offer over 100 different projects, and clubs are led by youth and adults. So both are partnering in the delivery of the program and in the program planning for the club. We have school enrichment programs where 4-H curricula is used to support and enrich the school day. After school enrichment programs, oftentimes we recruit teams and teams are trained and then deliver 4-H educational content in after school settings aligned with the after school program's interests. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about this model in a moment. Camping programs, we have over 40 different camps, summer and day camps. Uh, we have 40 summer camps and day camps move in an ebb and flow, but across the state of California. 
um, and they're offered every year. And then we also have conferences, events. We have state, area, obviously county, and then national. So we have a whole national program that young people participate in. So a little bit more, I'm gonna, well, that's a big model. So a little bit more, <laughs> this is where the fun comes in. Okay. So, um, so a little bit more is we've been working on what is a theoretical model that really defines 4-H? And when people ask how does 4-H work its magic, what do we show with them? Is it validated? And so what's consistent? And so at the national level, we've really been working on this model that guides our programming. And so I'm gonna release it to you today. So this the theoretical model really predicts that young people who participate in high quality developmental programs um, and have a high developmental context marked by these qualities, and there's research behind each of those angles, each of those little circles. But young people who participate in that program, that, that type of a program, that leads to thriving, which looks like this. And again, there's a research base behind each of those models, each of those marks on that platform. And then that leads to a host of youth development outcomes. And the ones we focus on are really around academic motivation and social competence, personal responsibility. So this model was being developed and has been validated um, by Mary Arnold. There's a series of publications, both that are in press, um, under review, but obviously currently published. And this model, they did find, in fact, that this model does work in this fashion, that young people who participate in high quality PYD programs um, do end up with these type of positive outcomes. But the important part about that is that youth engagement is a moderator of that relationship between developmental context and thriving. And thriving mediates the relationship between context and outcomes. So this is to show you that the world of PYD is a really complex, right, a really complex process that requires trained professionals, um, like 4-H professionals or others that are trained in PYD, um, to help support this process when we're engaging young people. But I want to focus on, for a moment, youth engagement. And the reason I thought that was, this was important to this group is oftentimes when groups want to work with us because they want to work with young people. And so we're like, that's awesome, because young people can amplify your work and your outcomes. But let's then work together to figure out that we're truly meaningfully engaging them in the activities instead of um, engaging them in ways that aren't as helpful to their development, but maybe to your project. And so when we look at youth engagement, there are really four components that the literature converges around that need to be present when you're working with young people. And those are opportunities to participate in decision making, opportunities to develop and practice leadership, experience a sense of belonging, and then working together to share equally in the decision making process. And so you might have heard the term youth adult partnerships, and that's what that four represents is YAP or youth adult partnerships. So um, oftentimes one way that 4-H collaborates is not only do we bring the youth engagement focus, but we provide training and resources to others, adults or, or teens working with young people. So I wanted to highlight, and it'll just take a few short mi minutes, Missy, about four minutes, to highlight a program. Yeah, if I timed it and it all works out, it'll be four minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, to highlight a program that I think really epitomizes the success of what happens when our statewide programs collaborate and you can we can envision this and what this might look like in an MPI space and the kind of projects that you work on. But this program um, is the Healthy Living Ambassador Program. It started in San Mateo County and it was developed in partnership between 4-H, UC CalFresh, elementary school. Hi, my team. Hi, hi, me. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sharing about the program that Virginia, our 4-H advisor, started um, in San Mateo County and showing how this collaboration um, worked and some of the results of Virginia's research. And so this program um, was developed again in partnership between UC CalFresh, 4-H, elementary school students, teens, and um, after school programs. And in the program, youth were recruited and then they participated in a two-day overnight event. Um, where there is a training offered to them on Elkis Ranch, uh, where Wei Ting is positioned. And uh, the training was provided by UC Master Gardener volunteers, Elkis Ranch staff, 4-H staff, and UC CalFresh staff. And the training really focused on help make, ensuring that young people were getting the basics um, around food cultivation, fitness, exercise, working with their younger age peers, and that pedagogy I uh, mentioned before, which is around inquiry, or experiential uh, learning. 
and then the teens and our teens as teachers model go back into their community and then they lead educational programming in after school programs and in this case it was in the school gardens. And um, the program, when the, when the researchers implemented this program, um, they were starting to develop a pilot. So let's look at the effectiveness of this program on a variety of changes in, in, in youth outcomes, including food preferences, as well as self-efficacy for teens. And so I've been working with Virginia a little bit, she's now at Purdue, to better understand the evaluation. So if you have questions, I'll share what I know from, from uh, Virginia, but also um, talk about what we're doing to scale up this program next. And so they looked at um, changes in both vegetables, preferences for vegetables, gardening, science, and um, self-advocacy for teens. And so for the young people, they had two different groups that were part of the evaluation, the pilot evaluation. One group was receiving HLA and one group was not receiving HLA. And you can see that there were changes in gardening, preferences for gardening, cooking, and science that were statistically significant and they approach significance for vegetables. And so this is in the teen delivered program. The programs delivered over eight weeks and there was a pre post evaluation. And then for the teens, um, they did a convenient sample and teens were interviewed before and after. And they did show that the teens started to report some more master experiences, thereby showing that they were increasing their self efficacy around healthy behaviors. So some of the things that we're working on next is this, we received a grant to replicate this program in Maradera County, Fresno County, and in El Dorado County. And the other thing that we're gonna do is see if the advisors in those areas wanna replicate this study because there are some gaps in our understanding. One, we didn't, Virginia didn't have a large enough sample to look at the food preference uh, changes among the teens. So did the program impact them? in those areas and the control sample was fairly small as you probably saw and so we don't know if that marginally significant vegetable preference intake would be significant if we had a larger sample size. So those are some of the things that we are working on integration wise and um, I'm sure Wei Ting could provide more information about what's currently happening in the program. Is there um, an income qualification to be part of 4-H or do you target specific areas? based on um, poverty, school poverty levels? So we don't have any kind of ties with our funding. Um, per, our, we don't receive a federal funding allocation like um, FNEP does or UC Cal Fresh, which is part of the Smith Lever funding, just like all the other cooperative extension work. So there are no federal requirements in terms of USDA's guidance for the program. It's five to 19. Our, our expectation though is that we serve all segments of the population. And so one thing we've been working to do um, so when we look at our demographics, one third of the kids that are individually enrolled in our program, those are, have tended to be our um, community club and our summer camp program. One third do live below the poverty line, below 185% below the poverty line. And that is even greater, we would expect that's greater among the group enrolled kids, the school enrichment efforts, the after school enrichment efforts, because those are delivered in schools. Oftentimes in collaboration with UC Cal Fresh, we have a, a really um, vibrant snack program. I'm not sure if you've heard about it, but it's in Santa Barbara County, and so that's delivered by Catherine Soule. So um, I would expect that we would be even more socioeconomically diverse when we're looking at those other um, avenues we're delivering our program. The demographics of our program do match the community demographics in terms of Latino, African American, um, Native American populations, and we're almost in parity with our Asian population. I would like to ask any NPIR who knows what the reaches are to raise his or her hand. I was just going to ask that question. Oh, good. Did you get it wrong? No. Heart, but he did get some jokes. We got some jokes. Health, one of them? Yes. Heart. Head. There you go. Are there any former 4 Hers in this room? <laughs> well, that actually ties into my question. I was going to ask if there's any research on the health outcome. That's a good question. We haven't. There is, and th people ask us every now and then to look at whether or not our volunteers are gaining workforce skills or things like that, or how how they're how it's affecting their development. 
do you know, we didn't ask any of those questions in our current Master Gardener 4-H volunteer survey, right? It was more about their satisfaction with their role. We looked at motivation and satisfaction of volunteers system-wide, okay. but um, we didn't look at that. <coughs> yeah. So we haven't. Our focus has been on young people. We do do a statewide evaluation each year. Um, it does have some longitudinal data in it, but not enough for us to draw conclusions. So we really look at it as point in time data. But there have been studies that have compared 4-H, both in California and nationally, as part of the test study um, for from Richard Learner 4-H to other out of school time programs that serve young people and 4-Hers excel usually by an odds ratio of two or three in outcomes related to grades, um, plans to go to college, scientific literacy, healthy living, civic engagement. So for, and it's really the youth engagement piece that I talked about, which you can see playing out in the program that I presented from San Mateo, that you really see how 4-H and engaging young people, and of course young people are more in tune and wanna to listen to um, a peer that is an adolescent when they're much younger, right? That's a more intriguing, um, person for them oftentimes as a role model um, and so uh, our outcomes are pretty strong across uh, across the nation all right so Missy okay all right so again my name is Missy Gable and I'm going to be sharing about the UC Master Gardener program our mission is to extend research-based information on home horticulture to a non-commercial clientele. So we work with um, the public in California, but on kind of home landscapes, um, community gardens, uh, school gardens, demonstration gardens. We have a phenomenal group of volunteers in California. On average, our volunteers give 65 hours each year, which is significantly more than we expect of them to continue their enrollment in the program. Uh, last year, we reported 2.2 million face-to-face -face contacts, and those are direct engagements um, with someone who asks a question of a Master Gardener volunteer um, or attends one of our workshops. We had over 4,000 projects statewide, um, 144,000 events statewide, and over 1,200 garden locations where Master Gardener volunteers are the primary agents of learning in those gardens. We have just over 6,000 volunteers. Um, we have programs now in 53 counties in California. And uh, let's see, our volunteers, like I said, donate uh, significantly more than we ever expected them. So about 400,000 volunteer hours a year. They also, in order to maintain their status as a UC Master Gardener volunteer, um, they do continuing education with us. So that makes us pretty unique um, in terms of adult volunteer programs. You get a very rich training with UC um, personnel, academic personnel, uh, in horticultural topics. Um, our trainings are a minimum of 60 hours, 60 zero. So there are significant, it was a very big investment for the academics and staff who work with the Master Gardener program. That training happens at the county level. And then we have trained and certified volunteers who give back in the form of volunteer hours and then uh, sorry, continuing education hours. So they're constantly learning and growing through their lifetime as a UC Master Gardener volunteer. Um, I, I guessed folks didn't have a lot of information about who the Master Gardener program is and what we do. So I wanted to share with you guys a program video um, so that you can just get to know some of our volunteers because they're truly the best ambassadors for our program. And I think it'd probably be easier if we just switched. Oh, yeah, let's see if it works. Nope. <laughs> Sign. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we already pulled it up um, on YouTube. Great. The Master Gardener Network has allowed me to be in different places that I did not know existed. Talk to different people that I probably have never met before. Relationships, long relationships with beautiful individuals. It's interesting how one thing that everybody has in common, frankly, to another thing that everyone has in common. One of the things that got me into the Master Gardener program was going back to gardening after uh, working a career and not doing it for a long time. Came into the program thinking. I wanted to give back. And showing what I got is I'd be given too. I 
next door neighbor became a master gardener and his yard was beautiful. And I said, Oh my gosh, I want to do that. I want to become a master gardener. I'm a <laughs> this is a demonstration garden focused on educating the community about water conservation. Luscious red tomatoes, 10 degrees zucchini. So another favorite of mine is the sensory garden. You've got ones that are slightly fuzzy and have a really pungent smell when you really get in there and get those essential oils on your fingers. We're here at the Carlsbad Flower Field. The master gardeners have been invited to provide a display and demonstration garden. I love a beauty lawn. This is Crassula calico kitten, Echeveria lola, Calanchoe luciae, Euphorbia tricalii six on fire. The Farm and Food Lab is located at the Orange County Great Park in the city of Irvine. This is one of my favorite exhibits in the garden. We call it the Edible Garden. It's our largest raised bed. This is our exhibit on pollination. We can look up by spinning a wheel which animals are the most important pollinators. Do we think of monarch butterflies, good or bad? Well, it depends. So the garden you see here is actually a place that master gardeners come and can learn how to do some hands-on gardening. I'm making my own soil for my garden and it's so rich and so good for it. We teach about fruit tree pruning and sustainable practices. Welcome to In the Garden with UC Master Gardeners. It is a phenomenal program. We have about 1.2 million people in our listening audience. I am Katrina Kirkaby, your host for today. And what we talk about is best practices in gardening. Of In the Garden with UC Master Gardeners. Class A Environmental Studies School Magnet. It is for students grades uh, K through 5. We have a variety of different science garden projects. We do very environmental studies. They're bougie chickens. Yeah. 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 Plants teach about where And then we have an opportunity to do lab work in the garden itself. So the students will start to see, and then they'll plant them in raised beds. So you have one raised bed for each grade level. Right now we're in Compton, California at Moonwater Farm, and this place is lovely. Beyond Compton, one of the oases of community. We have so much to offer in such a compact location. The owners, Kathleen and Richard, have opened up this space to allow me to facilitate wellness, community wellness events, to be a part of their programming, which is uh, my farm camp. Right in the heart of Hollywood, we're right next to the Hollywood Freeway, across the street of Fountain Avenue or St. Andrews. This garden was a vacant lot. It was actually an empty, rundown trailer on it. The community came together and decided to do something with it, and they, they decided to make it a community garden. Grow LA Victory Garden Classes here, the beginning gardening classes for people that maybe know a little bit about gardening but wish to learn more, or people that have absolutely no clue. It really is a gem. We were taught by University of California professors and experts in every subject from soil, insects, plants, plant, It keeps going. Everyone, you are welcome to watch our YouTube video anytime. Um, but the point what I really wanted to share, again, our volunteers are the best ambassador for the program. Um, and you can see kind of a smattering of the types of community programming that the Master Gardener program does. Um, what you... Uh, what we don't share in the video, but I think is important um, to communicate, is that our volunteers are empowered as extenders of information. Um, they know where to access good quality gardening information from the University of California and extend that to the public. They do not get volunteer hours for doing manual labor. So we are all about education, um, and that's what their projects um, reflect. So those demonstration gardens, um, they are beautiful because in the course and scope of maintaining them, they're also doing a public workshop. So if they're doing a fruit tree workshop, they're pruning fruit trees in a demonstration space um, as a part of that. So there's a, there's a community education component. Uh, so our program logic model, we have um, impacts in three primary areas when we look at our clientele, the Master Gardener um, program clientele, which is the public. So our impact is in the area of sustainable landscaping, 
food, gardening, and community well-being. Since um, I'm here, I figured I would focus in a little bit on food gardening with you guys. So um, this is all from our logic model. Our short-term impacts are that knowledge and skills in food production are gained, and then knowledge and skills in harvest and short-term storage of produce are gained. Um, our medium outcomes um, are that food is grown more successfully. And then our long-term impact is that human nutrition is improved. So um, we've been uh, in the process of really developing a framework to better understand the impacts of the Master Gardener program. Part of that is what you're seeing here, is part, components of our logic model that I pulled out for you guys. And then we just um, have finished piloting a statewide evaluation um, to look at the behavior change of um, members of the public who attend a Master Gardener workshop. Now, Master Gardener volunteers are adults. Um, we don't give them prescribed curriculum. We give them the freedom to develop um, their own trainings using university information uh, that they can get from academics and from our UC websites. Um, they put together their trainings that are based on their local microclimate and community needs. Um, so, uh, what we've piloted with our statewide evaluation, the first phase was really to look at whether or not volunteers are hitting on the types of topics and impacts that we want to have in each of these areas. Um, and so I'm showing you guys pilot data here. Um, we'll have a, this is from January to May of 2018, um, but we'll have a full year of data very soon to look at. Um, so uh, members of the public who attend a workshop with a Master Gardener volunteer. It's gonna be on a number of different topics. Those volunteers collect these people's names. They let them know, they let us know generally what their presentation was about. Um, so in this case, it's food gardening. And then the people who attend that workshop receive a behavior change survey three months after their attendance. Um, and looking at whether or not they have started or improved their use of any of the things that you see on the board here. So um, expanding, the varieties of edible plants that they grow from reducing food loss to growing edible plants. So we're really excited about the preliminary data that we're seeing and I look forward, I hope that I can share with you guys what a full year looks like for us. And then um, once we have a couple years under our belt, I think we'll really have some exciting data to look at. Um, so that's in the area of food gardening. And then again, from our pilot, spending more time outdoors, which has significant physical um, well-being implications and mental well-being implications. Uh, so 71% of the people who attended a Master Gardener um, public workshop improved or started spending more time outdoors. So really exciting stuff. Um, again, look forward to sharing more information in the future. And then I wanted to give you guys a couple of project examples. You've seen some already um, in the other presentations. Uh, here's a great example of a project that has implications in the area of food gardening. At the Rancho Cielo in Monterey, um, this is working with young adults, many or most of whom have been incarcerated in the past. Um, Master Gardener volunteers um, reinvigorated some garden plots at this location. And uh, they bring in uh, the students, the individuals who participate um, in programming at Rancho Cielo, uh, into the garden. So they've got a um, culinary academy um, with these formerly incarcerated individuals. Uh, they bring them in. In the actual programming at Rancho Cielo, they're learning about um, how to prepare um, uh, food. And then they're going out into the garden and they're working with Master Gardener volunteers to learn actually how to grow that food and what organic practices, organic farming practices look like. And then um, they have other programs where people are learning um, skills that ultimately they could leave uh, their time at Rancho Cielo and go out and work for a landscape company or um, do some of the um, manual jobs associated with gardening, garden maintenance, and organic farming. Christy, can I ask a question? Yeah. question? How, do, how do the projects get started? Like, is it that you train volunteers and the volunteers are organizing, or is there a missing layer that I'm not understanding? No, yet? that's a really good question. So volunteers, it, our program is statewide, but with local county delivery, because horticulture is very geographical, right? We have different microclimates, different growing zones. So at the county level, uh, the volunteers come together. In an ideal situation, there is a staff coordinator and an academic advisor who's working with them. Uh, but most of the projects are um, 
uh, ideas generated by the volunteers themselves. They tend to organize around projects, vote on whether or not those projects are going to be official county projects that they um, incorporate into their Master Gardener programming. So that's typically how they get off the ground. Um, let's see, UC um, CalFresh collaboration in Fresno Merced. Um, this has been a really um, beneficial program where CalFresh local implementing agencies are able to utilize UC Master Gardener volunteers as garden mentors. So they're getting real-time garden support. Um, they're learning how to maintain the spaces that they have. Um, and then the, the individuals who um, frequent the local implementing agency use their services, they're also able to take advantage of classes that are taught by the Master Gardener volunteers on site. And then um, here's another fun example, um, uh, an interesting thing that came out of the October fires in 2017. Um, the Sonoma Master Gardener volunteers immediately started getting um, a lot of concerned citizens asking about the safety of their produce, if, they, if it may have been exposed to ash, in some cases fire, certainly fire retardants. And so the volunteers took it upon themselves um, to uh, coordinate an effort to uh, harvest produce, take samples. Um, we worked with them then to engage some research scientists at Berkeley and Davis who then um, have accepted all of these samples and are doing studies to determine whether or not these items are safe for consumption. You can imagine, you know, a lot of people, it's clear if you have charred tomatoes, you have charred tomatoes, but what about the tomato, the potatoes that were growing underground, the tubers, are they still safe? So this is really exciting. They're looking at produce and also eggs. All right, that is my presentation in a nutshell. I'm happy to come back and give you a full hour on the <laughs> <laughs> We have a lot more to talk yeah, about. We could be here all week. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any other questions? I know you guys are probably all itched to head back. I, I have a lot of questions about the master. Yeah. Right? You and I can sit down later. But one of the things I'm really curious about. Um, how are you working with community gardens, school gardens, and campus gardens? Are you integrated into those? Are you trying to find ways to collaborate with them to provide them more support? Because I know with some of those Great sustainability question. issues for those programs, they just don't have the capacity to maintain them. Yeah, there's a massive sustainability issue with gardens that are created, period, mm -hmm. um, wherever they are. Uh, so the Master Gardener Program, like I said, has county-based delivery. So at the county level, um, most Master Gardener programs have a demonstration garden. It's typically associated with a cooperative extension office, but then they also have a presence at community gardens and um, some school gardens. So community garden presence with the Master Gardener um, Program, typically we don't create the community garden. We would come in and adopt a row that's going to be best practice. There, we're going to have some sort of relationship with the community garden where um, <clears throat> on a weekly basis, uh, the master gardener, this is kind of typical project, master gardeners come in on a weekly basis and they give a presentation on a gardening practice that's seasonal, um, that's open to the public. Anyone can show up on a Saturday morning um, in Santa Clara County. Uh, they've got about five community gardens where at the same time they're all talking about a specific gardening practice. So um, that's kind of the educational impact we have at a lot of community gardens. Some of our programs that have been able to raise funds have also been able to add the layer of informal education um, with educational panels, signage um, to help inform people who are utilizing those spaces. Um, and then school gardens, the Master Gardener volunteers uh, Five years ago, we're very much informed that we don't work um, in school gardens. So that has changed over the past five years. You know, I think as a program's growing, there are times when you have to kind of stop and take stock of where you are, and then you can grow beyond that. Um, so I came in five years ago, and it really made sense for us to reevaluate that policy. Now, all of the work that we do is tailored towards educating adults. So Master Gardener volunteers are trained in techniques to educate adults. We do not do positive youth development. So we partner with 4-H for things like that. Um, certainly, yeah, <laughs> with our other programs, we would partner to do more work with youth. Um, the way we work in school gardens where we don't have a partnership is that Master Gardener volunteers um, typically create an opportunity around garden-based education with 
the teachers, with the educators, or maybe parents who have signed on to sponsor a school garden. Um, so they train those individuals, and then those individuals have primary responsibility um, for working with the youth, but the Master Gardener volunteers can come in and kind of supplement and help with a, a lab or an in-garden experience with the youth. Does that make sense? I, that's a long, I buttoned that down real quick. So yeah. if you have any more questions, let me know. Yeah, thank you. I'm just curious, you mentioned a couple of one-off examples, but I'm curious, like, how in how many places, how integrated are the services? Because you all kind of, they're very complementary, but different. Like, are they, is it common that, like, a family would be involved in all of the different services, or it's more common that they're? You know, I have to say, so, so our programs are integrated at the project level. Um, and I think for most of our clientele, it's the University of California. It doesn't matter if you're wearing a Master Gardener apron or a 4-H shirt, it's the University of California. So, um, you know, the public doesn't enroll in the Master Gardener program. Um, they're part of the clientele that we serve, but um, I, I think it's yeah. based on community needs. So what are the areas of that the, like an advisor, county director, sees as their vision for the county mm -hmm. and how do, do the programs play into that. So there are some counties that do it exquisitely well. So San Mateo is an example, Santa Barbara is an example. There are other counties that maintain separate um, services across. So I think it's part of what comes out of the community assessments that the needs assessments the advisors do, what's the direction that the county director and advisors want to take, how's the inner workings in the office. I mean, I think all those play into it and then what's the capacity. Mm -hmm. um, funding opportunities and things like that. Some of, a lot of the 4-H projects that are integrated start with a grant. And so there's a grant opportunity, there's great relationships, there seems to be an interest, um, and so that's where the grant kind of happens. So the San Mateo is a good example of that. Santa Barbara integration with SNAC is a good example of that, and the expansion of HLA into other counties is another example, and then um, hopefully those sustain themselves. So I think it's very much localized. And just to mention too, I mean, this is a, Sort of timely brown bag for us to have and um, with the reorganization we decided collectively Missy joined us in the reorg of YFC and um, that program integration was a priority and we you know are now trying to figure out ways to bring those models together see what's successful so that we can provide uh, resources and focus on scaling those up where they can work and and integrating more across our programs um, um, so that we can be more effective. And, and certainly with SNAP and UC CalFresh, we're serving a pretty distinct population mm -hmm. of um, SNAP Ed eligible, but there's ways that we can uh, make all of our programs accessible to all Californians. So um, yeah, certainly uh, we're, we're making, we have resources so that we can make more efforts at the statewide level too, to scale up what's happening in the county. Can I just add a perspective? <laughs> <laughs> that question. Um, it is highly, it is it county specific, and sometimes we. I'm sorry, I'm late. Yeah, oh, okay, you're late. Um, waiting to it's also waiting. Yeah, and advisor <laughs> and um, interim county director for San Mateo, San Francisco, um, been that role for about two years now. Um, it depends on corporate extension exists because we have partnerships with the county, and it sometimes it comes from do we have interest from the county agency that's funding our operations to see. Um, particular services in certain areas and at the same time we have to look at our local staffing availability and if there is we are limited by programs existing service streams and is it possible for us to um, come join forces and um, for each program to expand reach to new audiences we have four test cases in San Mateo with integration um, UC CalFresh works, works with the HLA program, but UC CalFresh also has that state uh, implementation agency focused on school gardens. So beyond HLA, we also do other school garden work. We work with long-term schools. We try to bring the Master Gardeners volunteers in to support our educators and our extenders in delivering the program. Mm -hmm. Master Gardeners don't provide labor. That's very mm -hmm. important. That I think is important just to, to note that. <coughs> but they provide education. So they provide professional development for our clientele, UC CalFresh, Master Gardener collaboration. We got the 4-H, UC CalFresh, and Master Gardener collaboration that Shannon mentioned. Um, we're also trying to um, 
um, increased collaboration between the massive food preserver programs, which I'm sure Katie talked about, and the nutrition education programs. MFU program focuses on foodies, they attract foodies. <laughs> nutrition <laughs> education programs attract low income clientele. Either way, I see it as household food resource management. Can we then come join forces and then extend information to other places? And the fourth one is our case, we're in Chuchao with Night. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, great team. We're really lucky you're here to provide that perspective. Thank you. That's awesome. Well, thank you. I think that's thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Brown bag. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 That's a great sales pitch for all those programs. I know. Oh,